Mona Lisa, modernized for today's audience. Mondrian's vivid colors change to attract new viewers. Ansel Adams' classic photographs colorize to be more marketable. Sound outrageous? Not in Hollywood, where they're adding color to the classics of the golden age. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. No need to adjust your TV set. We'll be switching tonight from black and white to color and back again as we see and hear both sides in this debate over colorizing films. Joining us in our spectrum of opinion, film critic Gene Siskel, Roger Mayer, president of Turner Entertainment, and noted film director Martin Scorsese, whose works include The Color of Money. This is ABC News Nightline, reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. It has been called a desecration. Those who object, in fact, couldn't appear more outraged if someone had rewritten the Bible. Come to think of it, the last time there was this much of a fuss was when the King James Version of the Bible was reissued in plainer, easier to understand, modern English. And curiously, some of the arguments then bore a striking resemblance to the arguments now. The more passionate critics regard the colorizing of films originally made in black and white as the violation of something pure. They are unmoved by the argument that more people will now look at these films, just as critics of the modernized Bible were unmoved by the prospect that more people would now understand what they were reading. As Judd Rose reports, the focal point of this debate is a place where no one thinks of profit or the size of an audience, a place where all is pure. Somewhere out there is a place called Hollywood. It's not a place you can get to by a boat or a train. Hollywood is less a place on the map than in the mind, a place to escape from often dreary reality. The landscape of fantasy, it exists everywhere, even on a farm in Kansas. For Dorothy, reality was drab, black and white, but fantasy was a land of ruby slippers and yellow brick roads and emerald cities, a land of riotous color. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. A classic from Hollywood's golden age, The Wizard of Oz vividly illustrates how many artists, using the screen as their canvas, chose between color or black and white to create a mood, a sense of dark reality or vivid fantasy. These are works of art. They're as valid to me as a Van Gogh or a Da Vinci or a, a Michelangelo. And that's why many of Hollywood's leading lights charge that someone's painting a mustache on the Mona Lisa. We feel we are making new films out of these classic films. Indeed, they are making new, and they think better versions of old black and white classics by giving them a coat of computerized color. There goes Santa Claus. Oh, don't even mention the name. He's much better than last year's. Many viewers at home thought so. Last Christmas, the holiday perennial Miracle on 34th Street was shown in colorized form and drew an audience four times bigger than saw the black and white version the year before. When the colorized version of Yankee Doodle Dandy ran on TV, viewers offered three cheers for the red, white, and blue and made it the most watched film all summer on Ted Turner's Superstation. Turner, after paying MGM more than a billion dollars for its huge library of classic films, ordered 100 of them colorized, including beloved movies like Casablanca, The Postman Always Rings Twice, and The Maltese Falcon. Ted Turner loves color, the color of money. There are obviously a lot of advantages to being able to colorize black and white films. More primetime exposure for classic films, more viewers than ever before, and of course, more revenue on every side. He's probably right. Lights, camera, color. In this age of high-tech, big screen, stereo sound entertainment, black and white films are a tough sell to network, local, and cable TV, or to video stores. Like others, Ted Turner believes that most people won't watch, won't rent, won't buy anything but color. Ted Turner's nuts. 
Ansel Adams' Moonlight Over Hernandez is one of the most beautiful black and white pictures that has ever been photographed. Does Ted Turner mean that if he owned the copyright to that, he would tint Ansel Adams' work because the public is color hungry? We don't think the photos of Ansel Adams, nor the pictures of Rembrandt, nor the symphonies of Beethoven uh, are the same thing as the collaborative, creative effort of making a motion picture. What's going on here is a battle between the two forces that make up Hollywood, art and commerce. Now the businessmen say they're simply using a new technology to get new profits out of an old product. But the artists sum it up in one word, greed. It's somebody else putting, putting their technical, not even artistic, technical imprint on a film made by somebody else, on a work of art made by somebody else. The artist's work should not be tampered with, should not be altered. Milos Forman and Martin Scorsese are just two of the dozens of top directors and stars who say colorizing changes the intended look and mood of a film, changes light and shadow and depth, presumes to second guess the person who created the film with black and white in mind. Case in point, Frank Capra's masterpiece, It's a Wonderful Life. Can't you understand what's happening here? Don't you see what's happening? This is very discouraging and uh, infuriating to have this suddenly appear blotched up in not real color, but sort of bad postcard color. It took a certain reality away from the picture. I was just asking, why? Why would they do this? To which the colorizers respond, why not? It's people who don't have rights demanding rights. Only the public has the right to make a decision on what it wants to see and whether it likes it or not. This is a decision the public shouldn't be forced to make. That's like me saying, why not let the public decide between good candy and poison candy? This is poison candy for the eyes. In more ways than one. Because the technology is still in its infancy, much of the color is washed out, blurry, and inconsistent. Colorization to me uh, looks like some people who have been embalmed and put in front of pastel wallpaper. There's always a chance, of course, that they'll change Mr. Kane. No one has yet proposed colorizing Orson Welles' classic, Citizen Kane, but it could happen. There are some 17,000 black and white films in the public domain. The U.S. Copyright Office is deciding whether companies that market color versions of old classics can copyright them. If it says yes, expect to see many more golden oldies in a coat of many colors. I think millions of new viewers will be able to see films they never wanted to see before that they never had an opportunity to see before. Perhaps, but then, will they ever see these films as they were intended to be seen? We will really have changed our nation's memory of great filmmaking. We will have truly changed this art form. And that's why we have to stand up now and say, stop, we've gone too far. Film is an art form born of this century, and one by one, the indelible black and white images of its first decades are starting to swim in a wash of pastels and candy colors. The public seems intrigued with the novelty of it, so more and more of Hollywood's canvases are being repainted. And ultimately, it'll probably be the public that decides whether this is a colorful new life or just a pale imitation. That little girl in the movies found her answer after she went over the rainbow. Judd Rose for Nightline in Hollywood.